Namaste. So from the comments on the last video, uh, I think there's a point here that a lot of people are not getting. So I'm going to stick with Shankaracharya's commentary on Vedanta Sutra 114 and go over it again. And hopefully maybe this will bring some clarity or understanding. Brahman cannot be seen, cannot be known, cannot be realized by any kind of work, including meditation. Why? Because Brahman is the self. Brahman is the jiva. Brahman is the knower. So it can never be known. Let this sink in for a minute. The Upanishads say, how and through what shall that which knows everything be known? See, how can we see the seer? The eye cannot see itself. Similarly, the consciousness cannot know itself except through itself. The implication is we are already enlightened. We are already the self. We are already Brahman. Why? Because we have the symptoms of Brahman. Ramana Maharshi used to say, you cannot see Brahman, you can only be Brahman. And he used to ask people, are you aware? If they said yes, he would say, are you aware that you're aware? They would say, well, yeah. And he'd say, see, Brahman is already realized. So then what is the purpose of all the books and sadhana and meditation and all that? Simply to remove the ignorance. See, the point in the last video was that Brahman cannot be known without the revelations of the scriptures. In other words, Without the Vedas to announce Brahman, the existence of Brahman, and the necessity to realize Brahman, nobody would ever guess. Why is that? Because we are in the material manifestation covered by Maya, covered by ignorance and illusion. It's designed that way. So that as long as you identify with this body or this mind, you can never get out. In fact, you would never even guess of the existence of Brahma. Ramana used to tell a story called the Ten Men, or the Tenth Man, excuse me, the Tenth Man. There was a group of ten men traveling and they came to a river. And so after crossing the river, they said, hey, we better have a head count and make sure everybody made it. Because if you've ever been in the mountains, the rivers, even though they're shallow, flow very swiftly, and they can easily knock someone off their feet and sweep him downstream. So, 
They each counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh oh. There's one missing. So here, you, you try counting. So then the next one would try one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh my God, one of us got swept away by the current. So there they were lamenting, oh my God, you know. And uh, another traveler came along. And so they said, they told him, be careful, this stream is very strong. One of us, after crossing the river, seems to be missing. The traveler says, well, how many of there are in your party? There's supposed to be 10, but we can only count nine. So the traveler said, wait a minute. And he counted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You're all present and accounted for. What's the problem? And then they all realized, oh, the one who was counting was not counting himself. So this is our situation. <laughs> We're looking out into the world and we're seeing all these different objects and we're taking account of all of them in waking consciousness, jagrat. Jagrat means a multiplicity of, of objects, of things. But we're not taking account of the knower. You see, because the knower cannot be known without something or someone to point it out. That's the, when the second traveler came. He could see there are actually 10. But all the members of the 10, every time they counted, they only found nine because they weren't counting themselves. Similarly, we see so many objects, but we don't see the seer. We know so many things, but we don't know the knower. So how shall the knower be known? This is where the Vedas come in. They say, you are the knower. You are Brahman. You, the self, Atma, the being. The knower is known by knowing. <laughs> This is why when you become self-realized, for a few days you do nothing but chuckle to yourself. <laughs> How could I have missed it? Well, because you were looking out there for Brahman as an object. And Maya is very happy to present so many objects. Even uh, facsimiles of Brahman, images of Brahman. So even in our meditation, we can be fooled. We see a light in meditation and we think, oh, that's Brahman. Well, no, it's a reflection of Brahman. Well, then where is the real Brahman? Brahman is the one who is looking. Brahman is the self. Brahman is you. This is called Kevaladvaita. Kevaladvaita means unmitigated, unmixed, undiluted, 200 proof <laughs> Dvaita. <laughs> the straight stuff. And this is, this concept is what we've been working towards all along on this channel. And it is what was revealed to me in 1984. And that's why I call myself Adya Shakti Swami Bhagavan. Because I tried everything. I went through all different kinds of sadhana. And the result was always the same. I am the self. I am the knower. I'm the seer. I'm Brahman. 
So try to get this. Brahman cannot be made an object of perception or knowledge or an object of work, any kind of work, even meditation. So, well then, what is the use of the scriptures? What is the use of meditation? The scriptures simply let us know that Brahman is there and Brahman is the self and Brahman should be realized because it means the end of transmigration, the end of suffering, moksha, liberation. And meditation is for clearing away all the upadis, the citta vritti, as Patanjali calls it. Getting rid of the modifications of the mind, restoring the mind and the consciousness to its original state. And what is that? Pure objectless self-awareness. Brahman can know itself. It can know that it knows. It is the only thing that can do so. So Brahman is not known through meditation, through knowledge, through books, through any kind of work. But all of the different methods given in the scriptures, and there are many, innumerable methods, simply serve to clear away all the obstacles to knowing Brahman, all the distractions from knowing Brahman, until only Brahman is left. That's why the Upanishads describe Brahman as neti neti, not this, not this. Whatever comes up is not this. <laughs> Whatever is seen out there, it's not that. So, try to understand. Then, why do the scriptures present so many methods and so many objects for meditation? Such as consciousness, or the light, or emptiness, or various forms of God and so forth, mantras. And then there's all the rituals of karmakanda. Why do the scriptures give all that as objects for meditation? Because meditation works by concentrating the mind on a symbol that represents Brahman. The idea is to invoke the memory or the perception of Brahman indirectly. Because in the beginning, we can't do anything else. In the beginning, there is no other motivation than material gain. So, all right, the scriptures say, you're in Maya, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perform this sacrifice, chant this mantra, worship this deity, gain this knowledge, and you will be approaching the goal. Not arriving, but approaching. So that's why there are four yogas, four principal yogas, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raja Yoga, and finally, Jnana Yoga. We're now on the platform of Jnana Yoga. No more compromises, no more symbols, no more indirect realization, only full-on direct, uh, pure Brahman realization. That is the goal. That is our process. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti.
out.